Good morning. I am so glad you're here. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Uh, we are beginning uh, a new sermon series, but really it's more than just a sermon series. It is a 21-day journey for our entire church to take. We're calling it uh, Tidy Up, Tidying Up. Uh, when I was preparing for this this week, I looked online about tidying up, and I found out there's an expert. Did you know there's an expert about tidying up? She has written a book. She has some videos on YouTube. She has a series on, what is that movie thing, Netflix. Uh, her name is Marie Kondo, little bitty petite Asian gal. How many of you have ever heard of her? Oh, she, yeah. How many of you put some of her principles into practice? How to declutter and tidy up your home? I came home. I was not aware of what she, <laughs> what she had done. And I said, Sue, do you know um, Marie Kondo? Have you heard of her? She goes, oh, yeah. I use some of her principles. I go, well, that, ex that explains it. I understand now. Uh, she said... <laughs> Sue reminded me, says, you know, one of her principles is if something doesn't bring you joy, you throw it out. And then Sue smiled as she looked at me <laughs> and said, I'm going to miss you. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so I'm not sure this is going to work out real good for me. But this is a little 21-day mini campaign where we are going to look at concepts we know. We get it. We have done these things. These are spiritual disciplines. We're going to adopt one each week. Uh, first week, this week, we're going to talk about fasting. Next week, prayer. The next week, our devotional life. The next week, worship. And we're going to have a great time together. And I know some of you are going, well, Pastor, that's kindergarten. That is so basic. Yes, it is. But sometimes we get lazy in that. Sometimes it's just like your house you got to tidy it up once in a while. When it comes to spiritual discipline, sometimes you have to tidy it up. And these things are so important. Even though they're basic, they are literally the pathway to deeper intimacy with Jesus, a deeper passion in our prayer life. You know, sometimes you just got to step it up a notch. Now, there are people, and, and there's a, an unbelievable number of people that I know that need a breakthrough in their life. They need a breakthrough in their finances. They need a, a, a breakthrough in, in a loved one's life that they care for. They need a breakthrough in their relationships. They need a breakthrough in their career. And that's what this 21 days is designed to do. All of these different spiritual disciplines will create greater intimacy with God. Somebody said to me a few years ago when we were doing a 21-day emphasis of prayer and fasting, they said, Pastor, fasting, I did it, and it doesn't work. I said, no, fasting doesn't work. And he looked at me funny, and I said, no, God's the one that works. Fasting will just put you in greater connection with God, a deeper intimacy, a more passionate prayer. When you fast, you're telling God, I'm serious about this thing. I really mean it. This isn't just a casual prayer. I throw up in the air and feel like it's bounced off the ceiling. I am passionately going after you, God. We also, each week, have a different take-home guide. You can pick one up. I believe you can pick one up in the back, or you can access it online. And each week, the guide will coincide with the sermon. So this week, there's Every day, here's some suggestions what you can do in terms of fasting. I, I don't know about you. I love the new year. I just think a new year. I, how many of you actually stayed up for the new year to come in? Good. How many of you actually shot some fireworks in your neighborhood? How many of you called the police and told them that somebody is, yeah, okay, I just was curious. But I love the new year. I love it all. I love the fireworks. I'll go out in the yard and watch my neighbors. They put on a show for us. We don't, we don't have to. I love, I just love it, hearing all the dogs bark and go crazy and go, I'm glad I, we don't have a dog right now. He would be going absolutely crazy. But the new year kind of provides for us a clean slate. Uh, it's kind of a, 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 a start 
over. It's kind of a decluttering. It's kind of a rebooting our life. So that's what these next 21 days um, are, are all about. And um, my problem is I know these things, I do these things, but every once in a while I just get so distracted, I get so busy, I get lazy with it. And the New Year's a time to shore it up. I was doing real good with my diet, my exercise, and then Christmas came. And I, I, I haven't been doing so good at Christmas. And it's your fault. You brought me all those good things. And Sue, you cooked all those wonderful things. And, and it was cold. And you wouldn't let me go outside and exercise and walk. No, that part's not true. She tried to get me to do that. Yeah, exactly. You know, when I look at, I, I want you to open God's Word to an Old Testament book named Daniel. Daniel. If you open your Bible right in half, you'll probably come to Psalms, maybe Isaiah. Make a right-hand turn about, oh, I don't know, five or six books, and you'll find the book of Daniel. It's a marvelous book. Not a real long book, but a really, really good book. When I look at the Bible, as, as I was preparing for this particular sermon, I started thinking about the scores and scores of people in the Bible that needed to tidy up their life or they needed a major breakthrough or they were praying because there was a major problem in their community or in their nation. And time after time and time again, these people would go to, into a time of seeking God through prayer and fasting. And the, the biggest problem I had trying to develop this message is to decide which one we were going to look at because there are so many. So I thought we'd go back to Daniel chapter 1, and let's use him as our example to springboard this whole 21 days. We're, we're looking at, this is cool, we're looking at a 14-year-old high school student named Daniel. This happened 2,600 years ago. Let's see what happened. Stand with me for the reading of God's Word. Daniel chapter 1. I think on the screen I have the New International Version. Whatever version you have, if you have your own Bible, a hard copy, or an electronic version, follow along. In the year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hands along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God, little God, little G, in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and nobility. Now look at how they're how they qualified who they were going to capture and take back to Babylon. Young men without any physical defects, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. And that's better than they had been eating in a long time when you eat at the king's table. They were to be trained for three years. That's a pretty long boot camp. They were trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. Now, among those who were chosen were from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Are those names familiar to you? Well, they will be in a moment. The chief official gave them new names. We know their new names. To Daniel, he gave the name Belshazzar. To Hananiah, Shadrach. To Mishael, Meshach. And to Azariah, Abednego. But, now this is our key verse. This is the hinge pin. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. Now, God, <laughs> this is a great verse. God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. Do you know where you work and in your career and in your neighborhood? God can cause you to get 
favor with people. Hallelujah. But the official told Daniel, I'm afraid of my Lord the king who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? Well, the king would then have my head because of you. Daniel then said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare. Compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. Isn't it interesting? He has permission. He wasn't haughty. He wasn't rude. And he didn't say, you know, he said, I'll leave it up to you. So he agreed. The supervisor agreed to do this and tested them for 10 days. At the end of 10 days, what happened? They looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. To these four, you go, Pastor, are you telling me to be a vegetarian? <laughs> no, just hang on. To these four young men, you go, what am I going to do with those spare ribs? In my Give them to Pastor Sue. She'll cook them for me. Uh, these four young men gave God knowledge and understanding and all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. Boy, did, look at this verse. The king talked with them, and he found none, say none, None equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. What a great story. Lord, illuminate this truth to us. This is not about a diet. This is about a dedication to you. And we're going to dedicate our lives anew and afresh. And we're going to concentrate the next 21 days. We're going to concentrate on serious prayer. And we're going to see some breakthroughs in our church, in our families, in our career, in our finance. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. God gives Israel a very simple promise. Uh, they couldn't misunderstand. It was so simple. Here it was. He says, if you obey me and do what I told you, I will bless you. But if you disobey me and rebel against me, I will turn your palaces into prisons. I will, I, I will exchange the comfort of your freedom into chains of bondage. So you have fair warning. The choice is yours. Obey, disobey. Well, what did they choose? Help me out now. They chose to disobey, didn't they? And because they disobeyed, they suffered the consequence. Now, now God... God is always giving people a second chance and a third chance. God is always trying to redeem people. He sends these prophets. Even when they backslid, they rebelled against God, he kept sending these prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Zephaniah and Habakkuk, prophet after prophet going, come on, guys, get your act together. God wants to bless you. You're living under the curses because of your disobedience. Look, let's just obey God. Let's just follow God. Let's repent and get back to where we once were. Let's get a fresh start. But their warnings fell on deaf ears. They did not listen. Israel did not listen. And you know what? God keeps his promise. Not just those we really like. God keeps his promise when he talks about consequence. He talks about blessings and he talks about consequences. And his promises he keeps. So Israel, Israel disobeyed God and their disobedience led them into captivity. Their disobedience led them into captivity. They literally, God allowed the Babylonian army along with the king of Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar, to come in and conquer Jerusalem. Conquer Jerusalem. Israel. Now, in that day, Babylon would do what pretty much every other country would do when they conquer a nation. They go and they find their valuables. They clear out all the banks uh, and vaults and anything valuable they take and they, they bring back. 
in that day, usually the most valuable thing nations would have would be gold and silver idols. So they would capture those idols and bring them back to, to Babylon. But the problem, Israel didn't have any idols. They didn't worship God. They were serious about not having idols. So what, what the Babylonian army did, instead they went into the temple. And the most valuable thing they could find were these gold and silver utensils and articles that were used in worship to Jehovah God. So they took those, they brought them back to Babylon, put them in the house of their pagan gods. And it wasn't just about the value of those. It was like, let's rub their nose in it. These are real holy to them, and they're important to them. So let's put them in our temple of our pagan gods. Just We're going to rub their nose in their defeat. Uh, it's a way to further humiliate them. Well, not only did they bring stuff, but the Babylonians also selected certain young men and brought them back to Babylon to be trained. Uh, we just read that the young men had to be good-looking. They were well-to-do. They were sharp as a tack. They were creme de creme. They were first-round draft picks. They were five-star recruits. They brought them into their country to give them an intellectual, a mental, a spiritual makeover, a Babylonian makeover. They were going to turn them into die-hard Babylonians. Now, these young men, they were given, it, it wasn't like, now, a lot of the young men, I'm sure, were, were like slaves and abused. These young men weren't. They were like in a royal training, kind of a boot camp. They were given a full scholarship to the Babylonian University. That would be comparable to getting a full ride at Harvard here in our country. They were given Babylonian names. They were given some nice threads. They were given Babylonian clothes. But everything that was done to them and given to them was for one purpose, one purpose alone. I mean, the books they read, the clothes they wore, the language they spoke, the name they were given, all was geared to brainwash them into thinking like a Babylonian, acting like one, and living like one. See, there's nothing wrong with studying in the world's university. There's nothing wrong with wearing the world's clothing. I, I could never do that because I can't get in skinny jeans and I don't like holes in my knees of my trousers. Uh, but th th there's, there's nothing wrong with enjoying parts of the world's culture. There's nothing wrong with speaking the world's language. But there is something wrong when you let the world get in you. It's one thing to be in the world. It's another thing to let the world in you. And so Daniel does something very unexpectedly. I'm sure it shocked everyone. Daniel draws a line in the sand and says, I'm not crossing that line. Verse 8, Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. When he was asked to partake of that, he said, nay, nay. Uh, this is where I draw. I'll, I'll dress like you want me to dress, talk like you want to, but I'm not going to act like you act as you pay homage to your pagan god. I mean, it was like an alarm bell went off in his spirit. It was like a, a tripwire uh, was just crossed. Daniel said, I'll do all these other things. This is what I won't do. Now, why? Why was it, what was the big deal about pushing away from the table? It's the king's table. Pushing away from the, from the rich foods and the fine wines. Why? Most Bible scholars, and I, I, I agree, mo most commentaries will tell you, the reason Daniel used the word, I will defile myself, was because that food had been dedicated to pagan gods. And to sit down and eat and celebrate with the king was to pay ultimate allegiance to him over your God, and it would be honoring that pagan God. And so Daniel said, not going to do it. Now, when he refused to do it, do you realize he was signing his own obituary 
to go against direct orders of the king would jeopardize his life. Let me give you a good takeaway. When God draws a line, don't ever cross that line. And God had drawn a clear line for the Jewish people, don't have any other gods before me. And in Babylon, when they wanted him to worship the king as God and worship these pagan gods, he says, nay, nay. How many of you have heard of the Daniel fast? Raise your hand. You've heard of it. Okay. There are a few of you that have not. Let me just tell you this about the Daniel fast. There are actually two different times in the book of Daniel we read about a Daniel fast. The first one, the first Daniel fast is in our text today in Daniel chapter 1. Daniel fasted for 10 days. For 10 days he did this test. He was testing. He deprived himself of the royal food and wine. And here were the results. He got learning. He got skill. He got wisdom. He got spiritual understanding, favor. He got uh, a better appearance even. Now remember, how long did he fast? Ten days. Now there's a second fast, and this fast was 21 days. You fast forward over to chapter 10. David is in a time of more David. Daniel, I said that twice in the last message. Help me out, Sue. Make sure I get the right prophet here. Um, Daniel was in a period of, of mourning. And, and we're not sure what he was mourning for, except that God was giving him the revelation of the end times. And when he saw all of the horrible things that were going to happen during this great tribulation period, that he may have been mourning about that and trying to understand that. But he, he fasts for 21 days, again, pushing away from the choice food and meat and wine. And the result of that was God answered his prayer. God gave him spiritual insight. He, at that point, could interpret visions and dreams and so forth. So basically, here's, a, let me tell you, if you go home and look up Daniel fast, there are a lot of experts, and none of them agree on what specifically a Daniel fast is. They're all different. I, I went through probably 15 or 20 last night, and everybody agreed. Can you eat this? Can you eat that? Some of them may have 30 questions. People, well, can I have popcorn? Yes, you can have popcorn because that's corn. That's not, uh, you can't have wheat, though. Oh, but you can have Jeremiah wheat. Well, but you're not supposed to have any sweets. Well, you say I eat fruit and vegetables. Don't some ve fruit have sugar? Well, but that's natural. You can get, you can get lost in the minutia. Don't get lost. But in general, in general, most people agree it's a fast of meats, sweets, and wheat. Now, they even have, if, if that's for some reason too difficult for you, but, but again, it's a fast. It's supposed to be a sacrifice. But I know some people that do a modified fast, and they stay away from red meat and even chicken and only eat fish. Some of my Catholic friends do that. But however that you want to do it, and notice there, was, there wasn't anything magical about 10 days or about 21 days. Uh, we're saying fast with us. Let's fast as a church for one week. Uh, many people fast the entire 21 days. My daughter started this a number of years ago, one particular year. I don't know if you remember this, Sue. But uh, she just kept going. goes, I, I want to keep this Daniel fast all year. She went for a solid year. And at the end of the year, she said, you know, I'm ready to eat meat, Dad. I said, what do you want? She said, boy, filet mignon sounds awesome. And I took a, <laughs> I took a video of her. It's hilarious. Uh, she had not tasted <laughs> meat in a year. She started eating that meat, and she would, she, it would, you could hear her. She was just going, mmm, oh. She, find, she picked the meat up. She laid her fork and knife down, picked the meat up, and started eating it with her hands and go, this is so good. <laughs> so if you really want to enjoy a steak, do without it for a year. You will really appreciate it. Uh, Susan and I often, uh, Sue likes to do three-day fast where she does a total fast with no food. Uh, the Jewish fast, one of the most popular Jewish fast, was a sundown to a sundown. The Jews to this day will still do that. They'll, they'll eat before sundown, but then they'll not eat again until the next evening, the next sundown. And it, it, if there are reasons, maybe even physical reasons, why you can't do otherwise, that's a good fast. And the Daniel fast, for those of you who take medication and you can't take medication without food on your stomach, the Daniel fast just works perfect for that. So fast, fast whatever. Get your kids involved. Our kids, 
People fast all kind of things. I'm telling you. Uh, one gal told me, one pastor's wife told me, she said, I'm fasting social media. I go, really? You're not fasting food? She goes, oh, no, that's easy. Social media is hard to fast. And I'm going to concentrate on God and spend the same amount of time in prayer I would spend on social media. I was talking to some of our kids a few years ago. And uh, I said, what, are you guys participating in the fast? They go, yeah. And one kid said, I'm fasting chocolate. Another kid said, uh, I'm fasting television. Now, that's huge for a kid. One said video games. Can you imagine that? One kid, though, said, I'm fasting homework. <laughs> I'm not sure that's like a, a legit Daniel fast. So I'm asking you to participate. You know what? The Holy Spirit is creative and unique in the way he deals with it. So I'm, I'm asking you to figure it out. However, I do have a guide for you If you that each day we, we, we kind of follow something um, during the week, and you can access that online, or you can pick it up out here, and like, I think it, the, like the first day, you're to decide, what does the Lord want you to do, what kind of fast, how long, the second day, here's what we're focusing on, the third day, and each week, I will have a different guide for you that coincides with the sermon you have just heard, is that fair enough? Okay, thank you. Hey, three things I want to share with you very quickly for my remaining time. Three things that will help us. Three things Daniel did that we ought to do. Number one, we ought to resolve to guard our boundaries. Guard our boundaries. When they came to Daniel and said, uh, Daniel, read our Babylonian books. He goes, okay, no problem. When they said, dress in our clothing. He goes, that, that's cool. Dapper. I'm cool with that. They go, speak our language. He goes, I need to be bilingual. That's cool too. When they said, put our king and our pagan gods above your gods, he said, no way, Jose. There's a line I drew a long time ago, and I will, I'll do a lot of things, but I'm not going to cross that line. The king assigned them, verse 5, a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table, and they were trained for three years. Now, keep in mind, they're slaves. Slaves don't have Freedom to decide what they will or won't do. Now, they were not like slaves who were abused because they were in special training. They were in like special ops here. They, they were in the royal training, royal boot camp to become a king's servant. So these guys were treated quite well. I mean, they went from being dirt poor, having nothing, being just Jewish boys, to being very wealthy, they all of a sudden sat down with some of the finest meals and the finest accommodations anybody would ever hope for. They would be the envy of the other young boys in that nation. All they had to do was go along to get along. All they had to do is keep their head down, keep their mouth shut, do what they're told to do, and happy days are here again. But they said no, nay, nay. Now, I thought, you know, Daniel could have, he could have thought of a lot of ways to compromise, couldn't he? Daniel could have said, nobody back home will even know. You know, what happens in Vegas stays, I mean, in Babylon stays in Babylon. Besides, you, you know, everybody's doing this, right? All, everybody that's being trained like that, this is the, this is just par for this course this is the uh you know when in rome do when in babylon do as the babylonians that's what we do you know so hey a filet mignons fried french fries from mcdonald's that's fine fried pickles fried butter fried anything uh by the way i you can't have popcorn on the diet right okay i'm just checking uh yeah give me all the sweet tea uh that's uh, you can't put enough sugar in that daniel didn't say that Daniel said, no, Daniel resolved. How many of you have made some kind of New Year's resolution? Just, just wave at me. Well, nobody. Uh, okay, well, let's go. Oh, there is one hand. Okay. Okay, heathens, listen up. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> some people say, I'm not going to make it because I'll break that resolution before the ball drops, you know. And so... Uh, 
But, you know, most of us go, it's a clean slate. There's some things I can do better. I'm going to tidy up my life, and I'm going to create some boundaries for myself. You know, the majority of resolutions, you know what they are. They involve exercise and diet, and that's so convicting. I didn't even go there in this sermon, okay? But whatever it is God leads you to do, resolve in your heart. Now, to resolve means to purpose in your heart, not in your head, but in your heart. Do you know God doesn't speak to us that much in our head? It's usually in our heart. Uh, I trust my wife's heart when she says, I, I just have this feeling. I, I just feel like we, she doesn't go, you know, I have figured this out and I've analyzed it and here's the way. I just have this feeling and you know, about nine times out of ten, well, more than that, she's always right. That that feeling is God speaking to her heart. This, this is important. This was not a matter of diet. This was a matter of dedication. Now, Daniel wasn't trying to get in shape and lose weight. It wasn't about that at all. It was about dedicating himself to the Lord. He was under pressure from the government. you got to conform to this. He said no. He was under pressure from the other Jewish boys. Do you realize it wasn't just Daniel and his four friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It wasn't just those four guys that were taken. One Bible commentator I read this week said there were over probably a hundred men that were taken. And out of those, they would choose, and it was kind of like Survivor, choose the best of the best there. Don't you know he was in pressure from his peers? You talk to our young people today, and they'll tell you the greatest pressure they feel is not from the government, not from the parents, but from their friends, from people at school, peer pressure. Don't you know Daniel's friends? Daniel's friends said, Daniel, everybody is doing this. Come on. And Daniel says, no, everybody's not doing it. I'm not doing it. Daniel, don't you understand? Nobody's even going to know anyway. And Daniel would have said, I know, and God knows. They said, Daniel, do you understand? You have just offended the king. You might die. But Daniel had the attitude, I'd rather die for God than live against God and against his law. This kid is 14 years old. Isn't that unbelievable? The thing that's amazing to me is he's away from his parents. He's all by himself. But you know, his parents must have instilled some boundaries. We must teach our children boundaries. We must. That's the most important thing to do. I've heard a parent one time say, no, the most important thing is I just want to be my kid's friend. I'm not going to stand before God and give an answer one day for was I my kid's best friend. Did my, did my kid think I was one cool dude? No. First of all, I'm not cool. I don't talk cool. I don't look cool. I don't dress cool. I can't fit in those skinny jeans. I don't like holes in my knees. Uh, I've had that when I was a kid, and I got made fun of. My mama would iron patches on them. I'm not going there. Not going to happen. Read my lips. Not going to happen. And, I, hey, I can't keep up with the lingo, even with my grandbabies. I can't keep up. I heard, uh, I heard some kids talking uh, sometime over Christmas. I can't remember what venue. I think it was a youth Christmas party that I crashed. And uh, one of the kids was talking to another kid, and he goes, oh, man. I got this skateboard. It is so dope. Dope? What, your skateboard needs to go to drug rehab? What you, and so I said, what, it, what does that mean, dope? He goes, you know, man, it's lit. <laughs> and it's on fire. <laughs> no, man, you know, it's, I'm saying it's tight. <laughs> it doesn't fit you. This is an awful skateboard. <laughs> Finally, I go, are you trying to say it's just really cool? He goes, yeah, yeah, it's cool. I go, why don't you just say cool? We know what that means. Stop using coded language on us. Yeah, don't try to be cool. Just try to teach them boundaries. And the boundary, not, not boundaries that come from our culture. Those change. And they usually don't change for the good. Boundaries that come from values that come from God's Word. And by the way, we need to do it while they're young, not when they get old. 
Yeah, Daniel, Daniel didn't wait. I, don't, I can't believe he waited to that moment to draw the line in the sand. I think he'd done that well in advance. Yeah, see, we need to teach our children well in advance. You've got to draw a line. Don't cross that line and get involved in drug abuse or drunkenness or illicit sex or whatever. Draw that line early before you get faced with that temptation or that situation. Resolve to guard your boundaries. Here's the next thing. Rely on guidance from God. Rely on guidance from God. Now, the, the word resolve literally, I mean, literally in our context means to have a spiritual conviction, a spiritual conviction. Maybe that term is familiar to you. He had a conviction. You see, they could change his home, but they couldn't change Daniel's heart. They could change his name, but not his nature. They could change what they called him. They couldn't change his character. In other words, they could put Daniel in Babylon, but they couldn't put Babylon in Daniel. The Bible says we are in this world, but we are not of this world. He had some God-given conviction. Do you know the real difference between Daniel and all the other guys that were brought in captivity, of all of those people, there are only four that did what we're talking about here, Daniel and his three buddies. Well, what was different about them and all the other guys? These other guys were Jewish guys. These other guys have been raised in homes to glorify Jehovah God. These other guys knew right and wrong. These other guys knew about kosher food. What was different about these guys? Here's the difference. These other guys had beliefs. But Daniel and his friends had convictions. See, there's a difference in belief. Oh, yeah, I believe. And some people go, oh, I believe in these disciplines you're talking about, fasting and prayer and Bible study and uh, daily devotions and, and worshiping God and listening to praise music. Oh, I believe in that. Well, believing in it is not enough. You need a conviction that says, I really need to do these. See, belief is something in your head. Conviction is something in your heart. Belief is saying, I'm convinced of this truth. Conviction says, I am committed to this truth. I am all in. We will argue our beliefs, but we'll die for our convictions. That's why these disciplines are so important. Daniel started to fast. I think it's important for us to realize he didn't get the answer on day one. Daniel had to wait on God for the result. His timetable is not always our timetable. His timetable. He had no way of knowing. I mean, he really didn't. He goes, hey, test it. Let's check this thing out. Test it. He didn't know what he would look like in the eyes of the king, but I just feel like he was saying, I don't care what I look like in the eyes of the king. I want to look like in the eyes of Jehovah God, whom I serve and have given myself to. Let me close with one more point. We guard our boundaries. The second thing is we rely on guidance. But I think this last thing is really important, and I think Daniel did this. We remember, and we never forget, God is always working. You look at verse 2 of our text, it says, the Lord delivered. You look at verse 9, it says, God caused. You look at verse 17, God gave. Uh, there's a common denominator. Yeah, David did his part, but most of this was done by God. God's the one doing the miraculous. God's the one that's doing the supernatural. God did all of this. God's the one that caused Israel to go into captivity. God's the one that caused them to choose Daniel. God's the one that caused favor to be on their life. God's the one that gave them the answer to their prayer. Daniel somehow re realized God is always working. He's always working. Yeah, God was in this when I was snatched away from my parents and my family and my friends and my homeland and took me to a foreign land. God was in that. See, get this in your spirit. I really believe this. God always has a plan even though we may not see it at the time. No, God's not working here. No, God's always working. You just don't see the whole plan. God knows the whole plan. Because God was doing something that was bigger than Daniel's career. God was doing something that was bigger than restoring the city of Jerusalem. God had an ultimate plan to put Daniel in the highest seat of influence 
and he had to relocate him to do that. But God put him in that place of prominence so that he could play a key role in preserving God's people and getting an incredible revelation of end times. It was a bigger one. This wasn't a career move. I don't think. 14-year-old kid, do you think he had any idea where he was going? One of the cool things, one of the really cool things is when you get my age and Sue's age, you can look back over your life and go, wow. That little decision we made 50 years ago, we had no idea the consequences. We had no idea what God was doing. And that decision we thought was about us. Oh, no. It's about hundreds and a few thousand people that God allowed us to touch their life and advance the kingdom of God. And We could have never dreamt that. Verse 21. I don't know how many times I've read this, but I, I blow right past it. And I, Verse 21 is, is not just a boring fact or a date of history. It says, verse 21, And Daniel remained there in Babylon until the year of King Cyrus. King Cyrus? Wait, I thought Nebuchadnezzar was a king. You know, Nebuchadnezzar came and he went. Cyrus came and went. Their kingdoms came and then they were gone. And there's one man left standing in all of that in the highest position. Daniel. <laughs> God always, always, always has a plan. Daniel started out in our chapter started out he's a 14 year old kid now he's 70 years old and yet he's still most of his most of his life that he's going to influence people is still ahead of him yeah 70 I can identify with this I'm 70 71 I have another birthday oh I just had a birthday that's right yesterday I did a memorial service in Atlanta and this lady said man you look good for your age Have stopped on looking good. I started to say, Wow, that dress looks great on you for a woman your size. I didn't say that, I only thought that, okay? Do you know what? Daniel, Daniel at 70 years old looked better, still had the appearance without Botox, without surgery, he still had a handsome appearance and it wasn't just about his diet it was about his dedication to God and if you say uh, well one more thing God this is a good takeaway God has a greater plan for you than you do for yourself <laughs> you go oh here's what I here's what I see right here and God goes really well I can do exceedingly abundantly above what you can think or ask his plan for you is better than your plan for yourself. You say, Daniel, if we can interview him today, Daniel, how did all this happen? He goes, well, you know, it's a funny thing. Sounds like such a trivial little thing, but here's how, you know, how he's delivered from the lion's den, Shadrach, Meshach, or delivered from the fiery furnace. He has this vision, incredible vision of a statue of Nebuchadnezzar. He interprets dreams, sees the handwriting on the wall. For I mean, he does all these things, but he goes, you know how that started? In just a little insignificant way. For 10 days, I said, I'm going to push away from the king's table. And I'm going to dedicate myself to God during that time. And just see what he does. It started with that little video. So you may think, oh, these little disciplines, it's not that big of a deal. I already do some of those. We're going to tidy those up. And we're going to see God do something so supernatural we're going to see God give us an incredible breakthrough in our life can somebody say amen to that let's stand and give the Lord hand in advance for what he's going to do over the next 21 days Lord we give you praise we give you thanksgiving because of what you're going to do in Jesus name in Jesus name now let me tell you how all this journey begins it begins for you don't know Christ as your Savior, if you're
you're not following the Lord. Today would be a great day to begin following the Lord. And if you do that, there's a card in the back of the chair in front of you. Let me know that. I want to know. Just check. I committed my life, or maybe you've kind of drifted away from the Lord. I'm kind of renewing that commitment I made years ago. And you would make that commitment today. And if you do, you just drop that card off in the back. And also, I have this book that will really, really help you uh, and strengthen you. It's just called a handbook, and that's exactly what it is. And I'd like for you to have that. I wonder how many of you say, Pastor, there is an area of my life I really need to hear from God. I need some kind of a breakthrough. And I'm just trusting God that he's going to meet this need. Maybe it's in your life. Maybe you've got a loved one that has a, a serious prayer need. And you say, hey, that's me. And I, I raise my hand. That's me. That's me. Lord, in Jesus' name right now, I pray that you would meet every need. Give us as a church as we take this journey a breakthrough. Give us a new level. Help us kick it up a notch. We've already been doing some of these things, but we're going to do them even more passionately. And over the next 21 days, see you do something amazing. Would you stretch your hand out and let me bless you today? I pray that the Lord will bless you and the Lord will keep you and the Lord will make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you and give you peace. I pray that everything you put your hands to this week would be blessed and prospered of the Lord so you can be a blessing. Now, go and dare to be a Daniel. God love you. God bless you. Hey, what's up, North Highlands? Pastor Clayton here, and we are so thankful that you chose to watch this message today. We'd love for you to like it, comment on it, share it with a friend, and subscribe to this channel today. Man, there are so many different ways that you can keep up with us uh, on all of our social media platforms, on our website. It's because of what you do that we're able to do what we do. So thanks so much for being a part of our online community, and we'll see you soon.